Welcome to Chapter 9, Muscles and Muscle Tissue. Chapter 9 has been divided up into three parts. Uh, with Part 1, we will do a brief review of muscle tissue. However, we did cover muscle tissue in Unit 1. From there, uh, we will talk about the characteristics of all types of muscle tissue. And then we will shift our focus to skeletal muscle. We'll talk about the gross anatomy of skeletal muscle as well as the microanatomy all the way down to the muscle cell. Remember, in chapter 3, uh, we discussed the four tissue types of the human body. There was epithelium, connective tissue, nervous tissue, and muscle tissue. We've briefly covered it, uh, so you may remember that muscle tissue is responsible for using ATP, or energy, and transforming it into mechanical energy or movement, which is capable of exerting force. From here, we will look at the three different types of muscle tissue, the characteristics of all three types, as well as the four functions of muscle tissue. Before we continue, uh, we have to address a few prefixes that you may see throughout chapters 9 and 10. Um, any term or word that has a prefix myo, mice, and sarco in it, you should automatically think muscle. These should be buzzwords that go off in your head to help you think muscle. Um, a term that you will see as we move throughout this chapter is called sarcoplasm, and that's just a fancy name for the cytoplasm of a muscle cell. Remember, the cytoplasm was the stuff in between the plasma membrane and the nucleus of any cell in the human body. If you remember, we have three types of muscle tissue. Uh, for now, you simply have to know where all three are located. We have skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. Again, throughout this chapter, as well as maybe chapter 10, you will hear me refer to a muscle fiber. That term simply means muscle cell, and that's because the muscle cells of skeletal and smooth muscle are longer. Um, they sort of resemble a fiber, so we call them muscle fibers. We'll go ahead and start off with skeletal muscle. The next type of muscle tissue is cardiac muscle tissue, and as its name suggests, cardiac means heart we will only find cardiac muscle tissue making up the bulk of the walls of the heart. And we will see this in module four when we get into uh, the cardiovascular system. But cardiac muscle cells are also striated, meaning they have alternating bands of dark and light coloring. However, cardiac muscle is involuntary. We can't sit here and tell our heart rate to beat faster or tell our heart muscle to contract harder. Um, so other buzzwords that you should keep in mind, cardiac, striated, and involuntary. And last but not least, uh, we will not see smooth muscle entirely throughout this course. However, if you go on to take EXS 217, uh, you will talk a great deal about smooth muscle. Smooth muscle tissue is found in the walls of hollow organs, except for the heart. The examples that I have provided for you on the screen include the stomach, as well as the urinary bladder. We will also see smooth muscle tissue lining our respiratory airways, as well as blood vessels. As its name suggests, smooth muscle is not striated. It appears to be smooth. And similar to cardiac muscle tissue, Smooth muscle tissue is also involuntary. We don't sit here and tell our stomach to digest or break down our dinner or to push that food throughout the rest of the digestive system. This chart here um, allows you to compare and contrast the three types of muscle tissue, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. The first row will tell you where it's found in the body. This is extremely important for your exam. And then the last row or the bottom row isn't as important. Um, these are more histological sections that you would see under a microscope. 
However, you are able to see how skeletal and cardiac muscle tissue is striated, whereas smooth muscle is not. It appears to be smooth. No matter what type of muscle tissue you're talking about, whether it's skeletal, cardiac, or smooth, all three tissue types share these four main characteristics. Uh, you should know the four as well as their definition. The first is excitability. As we move throughout this chapter, we will see that muscle tissue receives a stimulus um, in the form of an action potential and its response to that stimulus is to contract or to develop force. Which brings us to the next characteristic, contractility. When we flex our muscles, we are actually contracting them. Um, and a, a muscle contraction is the shortening of muscle tissue to generate force. Next, extensibility. Uh, so if you think of holding up a textbook and you are lowering your arms to set that book down, you are actually stretching your biceps brachii muscle in the anterior arm. Um, so all of our muscles have the ability to be stretched. And lastly, elasticity. So think of an elastic hairband. Despite the fact that we can extend our biceps brachii or stretch it, the biceps brachii has this ability to return to its resting length, like an elastic hairband. As we move throughout the muscular system, keep in mind that the muscular system is one of the 11 or 12 organ systems in the human body. An organ system includes a group of structures or organs that serve common functions. The muscular system includes all three tissue types and they come together for these four functions. The first is movement. Normally we simply think of movement of the skeleton or doing a biceps curl or doing a squat or getting up out of a chair, but movement also includes the movement of blood through the heart and blood vessels, the movement of food through the stomach, or the movement of urine through the urinary system. Next, we have posture as well as body position. When we get into muscle names, we will see that certain muscles in our body help us remain upright or hold our body in certain positions. Next, we have joints. In the last unit, we learned all of the different joints in the body, but now we will see the actual specific muscles that are there to stabilize them. And lastly, a byproduct of muscle contraction is heat. Uh, so muscle is capable of producing heat as it contracts. And if you think about shivering when you're cold, that is actual quick muscle contractions to generate heat to increase body temperature. Other functions of muscle that we will see, um, certain muscles like the abdominal muscles protect the organs. We will see valves in the veins of the cardiovascular system. There is a ring of smooth muscle in your eye that controls the size of your pupil to allow light to enter. And lastly, if you recall from the integumentary system, there is a little muscle that wrapped around a hair follicle, and when it contracted, it caused that hair to stand on end. From here on out, we will focus solely on skeletal muscle. Uh, we will look at skeletal muscle grossly. So bigger picture, and then we will work our way down to the microscopic picture. But remember, skeletal muscle includes all of the muscles that we typically think of, like the abdominal muscles, the biceps brachii, the hamstrings. All skeletal muscles will attach to bone um, or to ligaments and tendons. Skeletal muscle is an organ. Remember, an organ includes two or more primary tissue types in the human body. Epithelium, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. It's quite obvious that skeletal muscle as an organ um, is primarily composed of skeletal muscle tissue. Um, but we will see that skeletal muscle needs a blood supply and it needs innervation or stimulation from the nervous system. 
we also find connective tissue covering skeletal muscle to keep everything in one place. And then from there, we will see attachments like tendons and ligaments that anchor skeletal muscle to bone or to skin. As previously said, looking at skeletal muscle as a whole, as an organ, uh, you have to talk about the nerve and blood supply. Every muscle in the human body, biceps brachii, gluteus maximus, receives a nerve from the nervous system, and this is how it receives stimulation. We also have arteries and veins. When we get into the cardiovascular system, we will focus on arteries and veins, but for now, arteries are carrying oxygen and nutrients to working muscle, whereas veins are removing carbon dioxide and wastes. Another type of tissue that contributes to skeletal muscle as an organ is connective tissue. And we have three types or three different connective tissue sheaths that surround different parts of skeletal muscle. And the purpose of these sheaths is for one, organization, but also to keep everything in one place and to reinforce that muscle and ensure efficiency as it's contracting and relaxing. You could think of these sheaths as tall socks or even stockings or even a sausage casing. There are three sheaths that you need to know. You need to be able to identify them, but you also need to know the definition, aka what does that sheath surround when you look at a muscle. Starting with the most external sheath, it is the epimyceum. Remember that term mice, M-Y-S, means muscle. The epimyceum is a layer of dense, irregular connective tissue which surrounds the entire muscle. If you were to take your biceps brachii out of your anterior arm and put it down on the table, you would actually be looking at the epimyceum as it covers the entire muscle. As we move deeper, we now have the perimyceum. The perimyceum is fibrous connective tissue, which surrounds a fascicle. You need to know the definition of a fascicle. A fascicle is a collection of muscle fibers. Remember, muscle fiber also means muscle cell. So a fascicle includes a group of muscle cells that are all covered by perimyceum. If we were to go in and cut open that perimyceum and expose this fascicle and all these fibers, we would see that each individual fiber or each individual cell is covered in endomyceum. Endo meaning innermost. Hopefully this picture will help uh, with these three connective tissue sheaths. Again, the first one, the most external sheath was the epimyceum. We could say that this is a quadricep muscle from the thigh, uh, but the epimyceum is that layer of connective tissue which surrounds the entire muscle. Again, the entire muscle includes blood vessels, cells, nerves, so on and so forth. If we were to cut open the epimyceum, we would expose many fascicles. One fascicle is a group of muscle fibers. Perimyceum wraps around a fascicle. One muscle as an organ contains many fascicles. Again, here we see the perimyceum surrounding a fascicle. A fascicle is a group of muscle fibers or muscle cells. If we were to pull out one muscle fiber or one muscle cell, it would be covered in endomyceum. Again, for this, you need to know the three connective tissue sheaths as well as what they cover. We're gonna finish up skeletal muscle gross anatomy by revisiting some terms that you should be familiar with and adding some new ones. So 
hopefully we understand that muscles cross joints and attach to bones or skin. Uh, we'll pick on an easy one. The biceps brachii muscle spans the elbow joint. And we will see that the biceps brachii attaches to the scapula and the radius. Now, that biceps brachii, as I mentioned, attaches to a couple of bones. One of those bones will serve as the origin. This is usually the more proximal attachment of a muscle, and it is also the immovable or less movable bone. Now, when you do a biceps curl, the bone or the body part that is moving is not the scapula, it is the forearm. Now, the other attachment point of a muscle is known as the insertion. This is the movable part. So we could say that the radius is the insertion of the biceps brachii, with the scapula being the origin. Now, two terms that we haven't seen before uh, refer to the type of attachment. Does that muscle attach or stick itself directly to the bone? If so, it is a direct attachment. This is where the epimyceum, or the outer connective tissue sheath, fuses to the bone. An indirect attachment is probably what we are more familiar with. If a muscle attaches indirectly, it uses a tendon. A tendon connects muscle to bone. Another example of an indirect attachment is an aponeurosis. An aponeurosis is a flat sheet, um, tendinous attachment. We will see this on the skull. Now we are going to focus on muscle fibers or muscle cells. So we're going to pick apart the biceps brachii and single out one individual fiber or one individual cell. Skeletal muscle fibers are a great example of a multinucleated cell because they require a great deal of command, and that's what a nucleus does. But some terms are bolded here that you have to know uh, what they do, basically, how they contribute to a muscle fiber. The first is the sarcolemma. Again, there's that prefix, sarco. The sarcolemma is just a fancy name for the plasma membrane of a muscle cell. The sarcolemma is that flexible boundary that holds things in and keeps things out. Deep to the sarcolemma now, we have the sarcoplasm. We saw this earlier, uh, but the sarcoplasm is the cytoplasm of a muscle fiber. The sarcoplasm is everything in between the nuclei and the sarcolemma. Two more uh, structures or components of a muscle fiber include glycosomes and myoglobin. Glycosomes, if you hear glyco, you should automatically think glycogen. Glycosomes are tiny little bubbles filled with glycogen in a muscle fiber. Muscle fibers use glycogen or sugar as an energy substrate. It's how they produce ATP. Myoglobin, now we will see that term globin in the cardiovascular system, but myoglobin functions in oxygen storage in muscle fibers. We also have several modified organelles. Again, organelles that you might be familiar with include the mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticulum, or the Golgi apparatus. Other organelles associated with a muscle fiber include myofibrils, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and T-tubules. We will first start by talking about myofibrils, and then towards the end of this lecture, we will cover the sarcoplasmic reticulum and T-tubules. Myofibrils are these rod-like elements, and we find thousands of them in one muscle fiber. So I'm going to take a moment to walk you through the structural organization of skeletal muscle. You have to know the order or the hierarchy of the structures that create a muscle. So we'll start really big with muscle as an organ. So think biceps brachii. Moving down this organization or down this hierarchy, 
muscle as an organ is made up of fascicles. Now remember, a fascicle includes a group of muscle fibers. So far we have muscle as an organ, fascicles, fascicles are made up of muscle fibers. Now we have seen that muscle fibers are made up of myofibrils, and eventually we will see that a myofibril is made up of a sarcomere or many sarcomeres. So as we talk about the features of a myofibril, we will cover what gives the myofibril its striations. What is a sarcomere? What are the myofilaments? And then we will touch briefly on the molecular composition. On this slide here, we are looking at just a part of a muscle fiber. So try to orient yourself. Remember the connective tissue sheath that covers a single muscle fiber. It is the endomyceum. But here we can identify the sarcolemma, which is the plasma membrane of a muscle fiber. We see some mitochondria in there. The purple ovals are nuclei. We see the striations, the alternating dark and light bands, but we have pulled out a single myofibril. And now hopefully you can see that one single muscle fiber contains thousands of these rod-like elements. Let's first talk about those striations. Earlier in the lecture, I mentioned that skeletal muscle as well as cardiac muscle is striated. We have alternating bands of dark and light along the entire length of every myofibril. The dark regions we will now refer to as the A band. I remember that the A band is dark because dark has an A in it. Within the A band or within the dark region, we will see the H zone, which is in the middle of the A band and it is slightly lighter. In the middle of the H zone and entirely bisecting the A band, we have the M line. M, think middle. And we will see all of these components um, on a more zoomed in view on the next slide. The I band is the lighter region. I remember that the I band is lighter because light has an I in it. We will also see that the I bands are uh, cut in half or bisected by the Z disc or the Z line. It's a zigzag line of proteins. Now we are going to snowball all of that information that we just learned on the previous slide into what we will know as the sarcomere. This slide is extremely important uh, and you have to know that the sarcomere is the smallest functional unit of a muscle cell. This is where we will actually see the shortening of the muscle in order to generate force, which we know as contraction. You have to know the definition of a sarcomere as well as its parts. Uh, so by definition, a sarcomere includes an entire A band or a dark region with half of an I band on each end. So you could basically say that a sarcomere is Z disc to Z disc. Now take a moment uh, with the image on the bottom of this slide and identify the single sarcomere. You should note that sarcomeres line up like a train of boxcars along the entire length of a myofibril or like a row of dominoes. Now we are going to get even more microscopic and see what actually creates that dark region or what actually creates that light region? We'll talk about myofilaments. We have two myofilaments that you have to know. The first is a thin filament, which we will refer to as actin. The other is a thick filament, which we will call myosin. The actin myofilaments are primarily found within the A band. It's a lighter region because they are thinner filaments. However, these 
actin myofilaments will creep into the area of the A band, helping it to give it a darker appearance. The myosin myofilaments or the thick filaments are only found within the A band. They're thicker, there's more contrast, which gives it a darker appearance. Now, if you take a moment to look at the image on the bottom of the slide, again, we have a single sarcomere, Z disc to Z disc. The entire A band or the dark region includes the myosin myofilaments in orange and a little bit of the actin or the thin filaments in blue and yellow. We also have our M line as well as half of an I band on each end. When looking at myosin or the thick filaments, you should think of a golf club. So the myosin, uh, the tail of the myosin rather, um, is kind of like the shaft of the golf club, whereas the head of the myosin is the actual golf club piece. Um, so we will actually see that actin and myosin will link up with each other to form what we call a cross bridge. Um, and that is what will initiate muscle contraction or the shortening of the muscle. Remember, the actin filaments are thin, primarily found within the I band or the lighter region. There are two regulatory proteins associated with the actin myofilament. They are known as tropomyosin and troponin. Now, on the previous slide, I mentioned that in order for a muscle to contract or to shorten, the myosin and actin filaments have to link up. They have to attach to each other to form a cross bridge. These two regulatory proteins play a role in that cross bridge formation. First, tropomyosin, and you will see this on the next slide in an image, but tropomyosin spirals around the actin filament to block the binding sites on the actin filament for the myosin heads. So at rest, myosin is not able to link up to actin due to tropomyosin. Now, scattered along that tropomyosin regulatory protein, we have troponin. Troponin will bind calcium. When calcium binds to troponin, it will reconfigure itself and when it does so, it actually removes tropomyosin off of the immediate binding sites. If you're having trouble trying to imagine what these myosin and actin myofilaments look like when I describe it as a golf club or a thin filament with binding sites, uh, this slide is for you. On the left, we are looking at myosin or the thick filament. Remember, myosin resembles a golf club. It has a tail, which would be the shaft and the handle, and a head, which is like the golf club head. Now, on the other side, the thin filament or the actin filament is blue. We talked about two regulatory proteins, tropomyosin and troponin, that are associated with actin. Troponin, you can actually see spirals around the actin filament to cover the binding sites for the myosin head. Troponin now is scattered along the tropomyosin. Calcium will bind to troponin. Troponin will change its shape, and by doing so, it pulls tropomyosin away from the binding sites so that we are able to attach the myosin to the actin forming a cross bridge. And to finish up, we will talk about two modified organelles of skeletal muscle fibers or skeletal muscle tissue. The first is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This may remind you of the endoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is special to skeletal muscle in that it's going to store as well as release calcium within the cell. 
you will also see a term further down this slide that is called a terminal cistern. A terminal cistern will be an expansion of the sarcoplasmic reticulum where we find more calcium. Think of it as a pool. Again, the other modified organelle is known as a T-tubule or a transverse tubule. And this is actually going to be a protrusion of the sarcolemma deep down into the cell. Uh, so not only is this going to increase surface area of the cell, this is how we will get that stimulation or that nerve impulse down further into the fiber to ensure that we contact all of the parts and pieces. On the next slide, you will see that the terminal cisterns of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and T-tubules are arranged in a way that allows their structure to match their function. Um, and that is known as a triad. You have to know the definition of a triad. Triad, tri meaning three, a triad includes one terminal cistern, a T-tubule, and another terminal cistern. These three structures line up parallel to each other. And as I just mentioned, we have triads associated with myofibrils. On this image here, we see one, two, three, five myofibrils, all included in a muscle fiber. In blue is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but where you see more expanded areas near the white tubes, those are the terminal cisterns where we find more calcium. That white tube is a T-tubule. It's that protrusion of the sarcolemma, which will increase the surface area and allow for the entire muscle fiber to receive that nerve stimulation. The structure of the triad will reflect its function, or rather the function will reflect its structure in part two of chapter nine. To briefly summarize chapter nine, part one, we reviewed muscle tissue and the three types, the characteristics of all types, as well as the gross anatomy and the microanatomy of skeletal muscle.